All right. Um, so, oh, and I'm getting, okay. Um, so like Ryan said, my name is Mara Hill and I am a mental health clinician or a counselor or a therapist at Alaska Behavioral Health. Um, and we are a big organization. We do a lot of things. Um, my main job is to work um, on our Little Tykes team. And just like it sounds, our Little Tykes team works with preschool age kids, um, typically six and under. Um, as we have kind of shifted what, what we do and how we use our time thanks to COVID, um, I have grown into working with kids of all ages over the last year. Um, so I have clients anywhere from age uh, two to 16 right now. Um, and the presentation I'm gonna give today, this training is titled Helping Children Cope. Um, I wanna be clear, children is children of any age. Um, and some of my examples might be young kids because that's what I have a lot of. I have a lot of those examples. Um, but the concepts we have in here can be used with kids of a variety of ages. Um, sometimes they can be applied to adults too, is sort of um, the sneaky part. Um, and a lot of the information is really heavily based off of a curriculum or a framework um, that Margaret Blaus, Jane, and Christine Kinneberg developed. And that's called attachment regulation and competency. Um, and so I wanted to give them some credit. Um, something you'll notice as we go through the training is the, the framework they use um, works in a variety of settings with a variety of people, which is um, part of why we use it at Alaska Behavioral Health. Um, so with that, I will find my mouse and move us forward. And I'm going to start with just a couple of slides about how our brains work. And this is where I always give a little bit of warning that I am not a brain scientist. Um, I understand how the brain works um, enough to know how it affects like how we deal with our emotions and how we regulate. And so this road shows how our brain works under typical conditions. And this is true of anybody, kids, adults, teens. Um, typically, if we're pretty calm, if we feel pretty safe, we observe something, we put that information into our brains, we interpret it, we process it, we evaluate the options. What, can I, what are my options in response to this thing? We make a plan and then we act. And our brains do all those things really quickly, but they do all of those steps. Um, and that can happen when we're calm, when we're regulated, when we don't feel threatened. If something happens that we interpret as dangerous, our brains still do those first two steps, right? They still observe what's happening, they interpret it, and kind of that alarm goes off that says, hey, something is dangerous or traumatic or stressful or threatening. And we jump on this shortcut. Our brain takes this shortcut. We call it the alarm system or the express route, and we just react right away. We go into fight, flight, or freeze. And so we skip processing, we skip evaluating options, we skip planning, we're going straight from interpreting to acting. Um, and this is really helpful. We all have these instincts and they are what kind of keep us alive in really stressful situations, right? Um, they've developed over time to keep us safe. But something that we know is that with repeated stress or when we're under kind of chronic stress, that alarm system or the express route can become the main road. Our brain really gets used to doing that. It says, hey, we don't really ever have time to process, evaluate options or plan. We go kind of straight from observing to acting. We interpret a lot more things as dangerous or stressful. And I wanted to include all of these slides. I thought about taking up the last slide um, because the last slide we talk about, like mostly specifically when we're thinking about people or kids who've experienced trauma, um, but I left it in because I want to cast a pretty wide net. I don't know any of you or your kids' experiences. Um, so for some of you, we might be thinking about the last slide, um, just what happens, you know, every so often we're met with a threat. Um, for some of us, we might be thinking more about sort of this chronic alarm system, um, what happens when we've been under a lot of stress or experienced a lot of really hard things. Um, and I started off with that because all of those things impact our ability to cope or to regulate. And so what I'm gonna to go to next is really a slide about what is regulation. Um, and coping and regulation, we sometimes use those words sort of interchangeably. They're slightly different things. Coping is sort of um, managing your experience in the moment. Regulation is more of the ability to do that on an ongoing basis. Um, and they fit together really nicely, right? Like coping can impact your regulation, regulation can influence your ability to cope. We wanna talk about both of them kind of simultaneously. So with regulation, our goal 
is to support a child or a teen's ability to effectively and safely in age and stage appropriate ways manage an experience on many levels. So we don't always realize when we're talking about regulating or coping that there are a number of different levels, a number of different things going on. We wanna be able to support kids in managing their emotional experience, their physiological experience, kind of the, the body sensations that are associated with those emotions, cognitive, so the thoughts that come up with those different feelings, and then behavioral. Um, and I think often behavioral is the most obvious to us. Um, and what we're always kind of thinking about is with a behavior that we can observe in a child or teen that really catches our attention that might be concerning or problematic, we always also want to think about, well, what need or feeling is underneath that behavior? Those are the two things that tend to really drive behavior. Um, and so it can be helpful to kind of break, um, break an experience down to these four levels and think about it that way. But yeah, really our goal is to help kids manage experience. And there's even more steps to that. Um, so this includes being able to identify, modulate, and share various parts of the experience. Um, and so identifying, really just literally like build an awareness of what's happening. So I often explain this as like um, helping to figure out what is the actual feeling that I'm feeling right now? Um, and what word do I have for it? Um, how do I identify it and recognize that it's happening in me? Modulate, and we wanna develop safe and effective strategies to manage it. And I often say, you know, everyone gets mad and everyone gets sad, and especially for really young kids, everyone gets excited, but those feelings can get too big for us, right? And if they get too big or if we don't know how to manage them safely, that's where it leads to problems. Um, and so modulating is helping us figure out what are some strategies to manage what's happening for ourselves or around us. And then share. We want kids to be able to communicate what's happening to other people. And sort of the sneaky secret is that kids are often doing this in a lot of ways. Sometimes they're not ways that make sense to us, that we understand, or that are safe. And so we want to be able, um, or we want to kind of support kids in being able to safely communicate what they're feeling um, and what they need to cope or to regulate that. And we're also going to talk a little bit about caregiver regulation. This is, um, I know this training is titled Helping Kids Cope or Helping Children Cope. Um, but what we also want to remember and what um, we sometimes forget to acknowledge is that a lot of kids need their caregivers, their parents to help cope. And this is especially true of young kids. Um, and it's also especially true of kids who didn't have a secure caregiving system when they were young. Um, and so we kind of snuck this in here um, because as caregivers, as I have right here, like we have to put our own oxygen masks on first. We have to make sure that we can kind of manage our experience before we help someone else manage their experience. Um, and the word caregiver is in here. It's a word that's used a lot in that um, ARC framework. And it's meant to be, um, I think I've said, used this phrase already once, but it's meant to like cast a pretty wide net. A caregiver can be a parent, a foster parent, a grandparent, a therapist, a teacher, um, kind of anyone who's helping to care for this kid. Um, and so as an adult working or caring for a kid, we put our own oxygen masks on first, and this keeps us calm. It also models effective coping for kids. It really shows them, kind of gives them a visual there. And it also helps us to respond instead of react. Um, when kids are having a really hard time, it's easy for us to have a really hard time. If they're having a crisis, we can go into a crisis. Um, and so if we regulate ourselves first, then we're more able to help them. I mean, I often break this down into four different types of like self-care strategies to help us stay or get regulated in a stressful situation. And the four different types of self-care strategies we have here, the first one is preparatory. So you wanna prepare for a difficult situation. And we can't always do this. Sometimes we find ourselves in stressful situations by surprise. Um, but if we know that we're going into like a time of day that's really tough for our kid or a particular setting or activity or situation that's really difficult, then we think about things we can do to prepare for that. Um, and just some examples, like a starting off point here would be like have a plan, take care of basic needs, bring a support person if you can. Um, and I'll use kind of like doing this training as an example. I do a lot of trainings 
Um, but I always get like a little anxious before each one. I want it to go really well. And so things that I did to prepare for today, um, you know, I talked to the other people that live in my home and kind of we made a plan for where people were going to be during this time. Um, I knew I was going to feel more self-conscious if other people were around. Um, you know, taking care of basic needs, I made sure that I wasn't coming into this hungry, um, made sure that I wasn't coming to it thirsty. Um, and another sort of little secret, I changed into some comfier pants. Um, wanted to feel really prepared. Um, so those are some examples of, the, you know, some things that I did or on there, things you can do to prepare for um, a potentially tricky situation. The second kind of self-care strategy we talk about is in the pocket. Um, and these are things that you can kind of carry with you just like in the pocket sounds um, in case either you are met with a surprise situation or that you just think like you might need in a situation you're going into. So that can be as simple as taking a deep breath, kind of the ultimate therapist recommendation. Um, it can be counting to 10. It can be using self-affirmation statements um, or little mantras that you have. Um, I once worked with a caregiver who would come in for family therapy at the end of a really long day. Um, and she did a phenomenal job, but um, had a little trouble like with her energy. Like sometimes she didn't feel like she had enough energy. And um, one day she just found a piece of chocolate in her pocket and she ate that and it like got her through. And so that became her preparatory strategy where she would just like sneak a piece of candy before every session. Um, and that was all she needed. She was good to go. Um, so those are some of those in the pocket. Like for right now, some of the in the pocket things I have, I've got a cup of tea, I've got some water right here with me. I wanted to have things nearby that I might need. Recovery. Um, so those are things that you can do after a stressful situation has happened. And sometimes we plan these out. Like if I know I'm going to have a really tough day, I might schedule a fun activity for myself in the evening. Um, again, sometimes something stressful happens when you don't expect it, and then you're kind of brainstorming what you're going to do after that. So sometimes it's calling a friend or a family member, having a cup of tea or coffee or something else that you enjoy, exercising or getting outside, and when you're ready, thinking of one positive part of the day. And those are some examples that we have. I'm sure there are other things that people use to kind of cope in terms of recovery. Um, and, you know, I didn't plan on any recoveries for this. I don't, I don't think I'll quite need those. Um, but one that I often use is kind of going outside, changing my environment, getting some fresh air. And then there are also ongoing self-care strategies. Um, and these are things that we try to just build into our days and our routines um, to make sure that we don't get totally depleted or lose our oxygen masks. And so examples of this might be making time for yourself, using a support team, and providing for your own basic self-care needs, which sounds super basic, but it's really easy to forget and let that slip when you're a parent or someone giving care to a kid. So that's like sleep, food, healthcare, um, as much as possible. And so when we think about self-care, um, I once did a self-care training uh, for a group of folks and one woman said, you know, self-care is all well and good, but I have four kids, I work full time and I go to school, I can't go to the spa this weekend. And I was like, that's okay. Like that might be a really big recovery tool for some people, but self-care can also just be these really little things that we're doing every day um, to manage and to, and to kind of keep ourselves going. Um, so we, we talk about self-care for caregivers because you have to do that to then take care of a kid. Um, and so now we'll kind of shift into kids. And um, I know we're talking about kids and teens. Um, I did want to put a plug in here for like early childhood considerations. And considerations um, also for kids who might be older but who might not have had um, like a responsive or stable caregiving system early on in life. Um, so something that we really like to stress that it's easy for a lot of people to forget is that kids have to learn how to regulate with caregivers before they can take the step to regulating on their own. And so if we think about an example of like an infant, like a tiny baby, um, that baby can't take care of its own needs, right? And something that we don't always realize is that when that baby's hungry, it doesn't even actually know that that's what hunger is. It knows that it feels something, something feels wrong, and then it cries, and then someone responds to that and feeds it, right? And we hear all the time people say like, oh, that's the hungry cry, or like, oh, that's the wants to be held cry. Um, and so you attune to your baby, you kind of get to know it really well and learn what it needs. 
and you pick it up and you feed it and you're probably holding it close and talking to it too. And after that happens thousands and thousands of times, that baby grows up into a toddler who can recognize, though I have this feeling, that means I'm hungry, I need something to eat. Um, but we learn that from our parents, from our caregivers. And it's the same thing with other feelings and other experiences too. Um, we learn what our feelings are and how to kind of like fix them or manage them from the adults in our lives. And so as parents and caregivers, we can help with this by doing a few things that I have listed out here. One of those things that's super easy to do anywhere, anytime is reflection. So that is recognizing and naming the feeling for the child. Um, and I do this for young kids. I do this for my teenage clients too. Um, and that's as simple as noticing what they're feeling and saying it out loud for them. Um, you know, I see a really big smile on your face. I can tell that made you really happy. Um, oh gosh, you're jumping up and down. You're really excited to go onto the playground. Um, doing things like that. So reflecting what the feeling is, giving it a name, sometimes linking it to what's making them feel that way. Um, so that's one that's really easy to kind of pull out of your pocket that can be really helpful for kids. And um, we can also model. And modeling is providing a visual language for understanding feelings and regulation. And so sometimes we're going to be doing that through um, like books or movies or other media, like other visual things. Often we're doing it through ourselves. Um, and I sometimes work with parents or caregivers who say, you know, I didn't, I don't want my kid to ever see me mad or I don't want my kid to ever see me sad. Um, and we do want to be, you know, thoughtful about kind of like how we react in front of our kids. Um, but it can also be really helpful for kids to see a parent get frustrated or a little angry or a little sad and then see them cope with that and manage it. Um, and so sometimes this might look like um, letting a kid, you know, I was talking to a family um, just this morning where they talked about, oh, you know, when that happens, we both have to take a little bit of space. You know, one of us goes into this room, one goes into this room. Um, and the mom actually said, you know, and sometimes, and sometimes she's ready to come out before I'm ready to come out. And I let her know, I'm still feeling frustrated. I'm going to keep taking a little bit of space. Um, and that's okay to kind of like model and narrate what you're doing and let your child or your teen know that like, these feelings come up and here's how we can manage them. Um, the third thing we have listed on here is stimulation and soothing. And so this is supporting the achievement and maintenance of increasing or decreasing energy. Um, and that might look like doing things to encourage kids to get their energy up. Um, if they're feeling um, kind of down, kind of low, we might do um, some different activities. Um, if it's not too super cold, we might go outside. Um, we're probably gonna have to do those things with them to kind of get them going. Um, alternatively, if their energy is like way too high, we might need to do things with them to bring it down lower. You know, you're bouncing off the walls, um, but we live in a pretty small space and it's too late to go outside. Um, we're gonna do some coloring together. We're gonna watch a movie together as a family, kind of whatever that is. So sometimes we've got to help get it up and sometimes we've got to help get it down. Um, and we're gonna be doing that with kids. Um, the second thing we want to think about in terms of early childhood, um, and I think particularly early childhood with this one, like kind of true to the title, um, is that need fulfillment and physiology are super linked to regulation. Um, especially for young kids and really any young kid, energy is really easily disrupted. Feelings are really easily disrupted by physiology, so things that have to do with our body. So if we're hungry, if we're sleepy, um, we're going to see more rapid shifts um, than we do in, in adults or in older kids. And so that's something that's super normal with young kids. Um, I think we probably all, all had the experience of uh, a toddler doing just fine until we've like pushed nap time too far and then like, oh, rapidly things are going poorly. Um, and that's because, yeah, they're just more easily disrupted by that. Um, another thing we think about, um, again, usually with young kids, is that language skills, um, they're generally basic, but they're easily disrupted by strong feelings and big energy. And that can be, I want to be really um, kind of clear, often when we say big feelings or strong feelings, we use that to mean like mad or sad or those really uncomfortable ones. 
but it can also mean things like happy and excited. Like if we get too excited, that might kind of cause some problems for us and we might have a hard time with it. Um, and I see this happen a lot in young kids where both kind of expressive and receptive language is disrupted when those feelings are really big. Um, and occasionally it happens to adults too. Um, I actually had a friend who had a situation at work that was um, really, really frustrating for her and she was telling me about it and she said, you know, Mara, I was so mad I couldn't talk. And she had this tone of voice, like, how could that happen? Like, isn't that wild? And I was like, yeah, that happens all the time in childhood. Um, and we grow up and we kind of like are able to retain more of that. But sometimes if that is like too overpowering, we lose our language skills. Um, so the last two, yeah, are usually, usually really with young kids, um, occasionally with older kids and with adults as well. Um, when we're thinking about those first kind of um, things that I was talking about, the reflection, the modeling, ramping energy up or down. And those are things that really we find ourselves using with kids of all ages. So this one, um, this slide is titled comfortable and effective. Um, and we use those words a lot. Sometimes, sometimes I swap out effective for like how good of a match is it. Um, but I mentioned energy before, kind of ramping energy up, ramping it down. Um, something that we talk with kids and parents a lot about is energy. We want to normalize and teach the concept of energy. We all have different energy in our bodies, kids, teenagers, adults. It's not good or bad. Um, it's just different. Um, and I know like I tend to be more of a high energy person. Having more energy in my body feels pretty good to me. Uh, when my energy is lower, it tends to be a little less comfortable. Like I kind of have a harder time dealing with it. But I have friends and I have family members who are just like lower energy people. That's super comfy for them. And that's okay. We want to then link energy with feelings. Um, so often the feeling isn't the problem. The energy associated with it is the problem. So like I said, the, you know, everyone's going to get mad. Everyone's going to get sad. Everyone's going to get excited. Um, if the energy associated is too big, that's where we see a problem. If it's too big for us to manage. And energy can be a great place to start with kids who are really young and don't grasp like feelings words yet, or kids for whom feelings feel really like uncomfortable and vulnerable. Um, and that's true, again, for kids of all ages that we work with. Um, I've, got, I've got teenagers that I work with where we're not at a place to be really talking about feelings yet because that can be kind of pretty loaded. Um, but energy feels safer and that's a better place for us to start is thinking about how high is our energy, how are we managing our energy. So related to that, we want to build an understanding of the comfort zone. Everyone's comfort zone is different, just like all of our energies are different. Um, so what level of energy feels comfortable to you? What level of energy feels comfortable to your kid? Um, and what kind of can keep us in that comfort zone? If we get above or below it, that's when we're going to be using some coping, some regulation skills. Um, and then we want to create an understanding of the role of context. And I'll um, probably come back to this in the next couple of slides, but our energy and whether it's like a good match and helpful is pretty dependent on what context we're in and what our environment is. It's so like I referenced before, if, um, it's like if I'm a high energy person and right now I have high energy in my body, that's super comfy for me. Um, and if it's after work and I'm going skiing or I'm going outside, that's a really good match for what I'm doing. Great, I'm good to go. If I'm a really high energy person and I've got really high energy right now and it's time to go to bed, um, I have more of a problem. Um, or if it's time to like sit really still on my computer for the entire day, I have more of a problem. I've got to manage that a little better. Um, and so we want to think about how, how that can really be part of the factor too. And then we want to facilitate a sense of agency over modulation. So build the, really that means like kind of build the ability to regulate your energy to change it. We want to build a toolbox. And I wrote here, we want to build two because we talked a couple slides ago about kind of caregiver self-care. We want tools for that. So we want you to have a toolbox and we want your kid to have a toolbox of coping and regulation skills. And so we're going to dive a little bit more into energy. Um, and this is a scale that um, the two women who developed ARC came up with. But I also like to be really clear, we can use numbers, we can use words, like there's so many ways to communicate what your energy is. And for some people, numbers make a lot of sense, saying I'm at, a, I'm at a 10 energy, you know just what I'm talking about. 
Um, for some people, they don't like using the numbers and, and even coworkers of mine, they say, oh, I'm high, medium or low. And um, we wanna do more of the words. And then with some kids that we work with, we have like pictures of animals, right? Do I feel like, um, like a shark or like a turtle? Um, you can get kind of creative with it and make your own scale. So there's three steps when we're talking about our energy. Um, and we wanna build awareness of our energy so that we can cope with it. And so the first step is to identify where is our energy? Is it high, medium, or low? The second step is, like I said before, how comfortable does that feel to you and your body? If you are naturally a pretty low energy person and you have low energy right now, it's probably pretty comfortable. Um, if not, it might be a little bit less comfortable. It can also depend on where that energy is coming from. Like a high excited energy might be more comfortable than like a high anxious energy. And you can build that in kind of as you go. And then lastly, like I talked about before, we think about, is it a good match? Is this energy a good match for what I'm doing right now? If all of those things line up, you're good to go. Um, if they don't quite line up, then that's where we bring in kind of like our regulation and our coping skills. Um, and so we put it all together. This is a scale that I use with kids. I've used one like this with kids as low as, or excuse me, as young as um, seven. Um, but sometimes we're also doing this not really like with all of it laid out. Like sometimes we're kind of just checking in with kids about, oh, it looks like your energy is really high. Does that feel good to you? Or does it not feel good to you? You kind of make it more conversational depending on the kid. Um, but this is sort of what's in my head when I'm kind of helping a kid work on, work on energy and understand um, where their energy is at, how comfortable it is, um, how good of a fit it is for whatever we're about to do. Um, and so, like I said before, sometimes we're using like that, that scale and the different colors, sometimes we're using different things to talk about energy. Um, one of the things that we can use um, that was on a couple of slides ago, reflection and modeling. Um, and reflection, again, sort of narrating what you're seeing in the kid. Uh, so that might be like, gosh, like you're bouncing up and down. I can tell you have a lot of energy right now. You've got, you've got really high energy. Um, or like, I had a kid laying, laying on the floor the other day and I was like, oh, I can tell your energy is super low. <laughs> real low, they're wrapped up, wrapped up in a fuzzy blanket. It's like, that looks really low and comfortable, low and comfortable today. Um, and the great things about reflection and modeling, you know, modeling being kind of like narrating your own experience too, is that they're super versatile and they're super portable. They work with any age group. You can take them anywhere. Um, so that's really helpful. And you can do it quickly too. Um, some other things that we use are what we call like concrete markers. And so that would be like heartbeat, body temperature. Um, I have a stethoscope in my office and when I see kids in person, um, sometimes we're using, using the stethoscope to figure out like, okay, how fast are our hearts beating? And then we're doing some jumping jacks and it's like, oh, my heart's beating faster now. Okay, like I've got more energy. Um, we also talk about like once kids are ready to talk about feelings, we might talk about, you know, if your heart's beating really fast, it might be because you're excited um, or it might be because you're nervous. And so we can kind of link those concrete markers to those feelings. Um, body temperature is a big one too. Um, with a little bit of like reflection and modeling, lots of kids can usually um, like recognize that change in them, right? Like, oh, my face is feeling warmer or like I feel really hot. Um, and again, that can be a variety of feelings. It's usually a higher energy. Could be that you're feeling mad, could be that you're feeling excited, could be that you're embarrassed. Um, but there's usually a higher energy there that we can help kids with. Um, some other kind of like visuals, like props that we use sometimes, a balloon or one of these collapsible balls that I have a picture of down here. We can just kind of narrate like, oh, things get bigger, things get smaller, energy's bigger, feelings are bigger, what can make it smaller? Um, that can kind of make it fun. Um, and then there are tons of books that can help to facilitate like reflection and discussion, provide visuals of characters, and provide opportunities for displacement. And displacement is sort of a fancy word and I haven't figured out quite how to boil it down without explaining it um, in, lo in longer terms. Um, but displacement we use when talking about a kid's own experience feels too close to home or feels kind of too vulnerable or too scary. And so we might say things like, how do you think this mouse feels? Like in that picture down there. Um, I might not ask a kid how they're feeling about something, but like, how does this mouse feel? What do you think made that mouse so angry? 
Um, or I think yesterday, you know, I was working with a kid, um, not, not ready to talk about her own feelings. So we talk about, well, what would make other seven-year-olds angry? What's something that could make a seven-year-old angry, but we're not like putting it right on her. Um, and so books and other kind of media things can be a really great way to start that conversation and get talking about energy or get talking about feelings. Um, and the examples that I have are ones for pretty young kids, but you could do those in books, like in young adult books, um, movies for teens, things like that. Um, I'll probably mention this on another slide when I have some, um, some recommended books on here, um, but it can take me like half an hour to read a picture book to a kid. Like we are stopping, we are hopping like mouse in this picture. Uh, we're like, oh, this mouse is mad. Do you ever feel mad? You don't ever feel mad. Oh, someone else might feel mad. What would help them with if they're feeling mad? And before I know it, I've made it through one page and we're like seven minutes into the session. I'm like, oh, we gotta, we gotta hurry this up. Um, so it can facilitate discussion, sometimes a little bit too much discussion if you're with me. Um, so in terms of regulation strategies, we want to look for in the moment opportunities to reflect affect, um, affect meaning like the emotion or the feeling and encourage child identification. And so something that I'm talking about with parents a lot is, um, you know, if kids are coming in for a once a week or if kids are zooming in for a once a week appointment with me, that's really great. We can build a lot of these things, um, but it's really important to communicate with parents and with caregivers so that they know what we're working on and they can be helping it or helping kids to do that like the rest of the week because um, we want to be practicing these things in the moment and so in the moment you can be you know reflecting feelings reflecting energies but also encouraging kids to do that too um, and we know that kind of those like real life real life um, opportunities are super helpful uh, we use like i said before we can use books and media to practice um, identifying feelings or emotions and we can incorporate that into a daily routine um, and a routine that I have for kids when we start a session um, with young kids, I put up like a chart that has different feeling faces on it and they pick one. Um, with older kids, they've let me know they don't need that. And so we just kind of do a verbal check-in of how they're feeling. Um, sometimes they draw it, um, kind of whatever works. Um, sometimes again, for kids that aren't into the feelings yet, we're doing the energy. Um, but incorporating that into a daily routine. And so just like I do that with a routine with kids who come to see me, families can build that into um, maybe like a meal time or a bedtime um, or other times that it works. Um, we also wanna practice modulation, practice coping through play when distress is low to prepare for use in times of heightened arousal. And so what does that mean? It means we wanna build that toolbox before we need it, before the sink starts leaking or before the pipes burst. We wanna be practicing these things when we're calm because that's when we can learn. It's really hard for us to learn and often we can't learn if we're like super activated in those feelings and that energy is really big. So we wanna learn it and practice it when we're calm so that then we can use it when we need it. Um, and finally, we wanna help support and scaffold attempts at expression. And so for young kids, sometimes this is show and tell that's really like managing a kind of stressful experience. That's, that's basically public speaking for kids. Um, they're getting up in front of a crowd, they're sharing something. And so we're practicing it in a really um, like low stakes way. Um, sometimes that's a guessing game. Um, I play guessing games with a lot of kids. Um, and again, it's like a little bit of a challenge. It could be a little bit frustrating. We can kind of keep building more of that in and just practicing managing that for ourselves. Um, and then something that I always think about too is like sharing creations with others. Like if that's a drawing or something you made out of Legos. Um, and this can be true for older kids too with like art projects. Um, I, had a, I had a teenage client recently share with me like, um, like an animated movie that she made. Um, that's something that can be super helpful that we can kind of reflect on and, and uh, support too because there's some vulnerability in that too, right? It's something that you made if you want to show it to someone else, you're probably pretty proud of it. Um, you probably worked pretty hard on it. Um, and so kind of sharing what we've created with others is another way to help with that expression. Um, there's also a lot that we can like praise and reflect on in that too, right? Like think about all the colors you used in this picture, how careful your hands were. You must've had a really calm body to do this. Um, and so there's a lot that, that goes into that. Um, so those are three really just sort of like basic starting off points. Um, there's also other ways, of course, that we can help kids 
um, express themselves. Um, I talked about books and media and the environment. So this is an example of like the feeling faces that I either pull up and share on Zoom or have on my door um, for kids to pick from. Um, we talk about you might read the words, but you might just read the faces too. Um, and so being able to pick that and then I'll often ask them, well, I wonder what made you feel that way today. And we want to build awareness around that so that we can manage it. Um, and so if we know that certain things make us happy, we want to remember those things, maybe build them into our day or use them as a distraction when we're upset. Um, if there are certain things that we know make us frustrated or we know make us angry, but they're part of our day and we have to do them, then we want to be aware of that so we can prepare more for them. Um, on the other side um, is a book that I actually just read this morning at 8 a.m. with a kid called In My Heart. Um, it's a really lovely book that goes through just about every feeling you can think of. Um, and what might make us feel that way and what we can do with that feeling. Um, and it's a super, super sweet one. I think most of the kids I work with end up with a copy of that at home at some point. Um, so those are, again, examples aimed at younger kids. Um, but you know, I've also read like a number of young adult books that deal with like frustration or anger or challenges. Um, there are lots of TV shows that have that too. Really, once you start looking, you sort of see it everywhere. Um, and so there's lots of things out there that can kind of help facilitate that conversation. Um, and I'm sometimes a little vague about this and only have a couple examples right here because it can be so many things for, for every kid and for every family, depending on what you're into. Um, I work with a lot of families who are very into video games and that is not something that I know anything about, but I can definitely help them talk about it and help them figure out how that's a regulating coping skill or what parts in that are a little frustrating or what character is having this emotion or something. Um, so can, you can really kind of make it fit your family. I have a list of different ways to practice regulation through play. So this part is aimed at younger kids. Um, although I have to say, the more I work with younger kids, the more I really like a lot of these things too. Um, and sort of the concepts of them can be applied to a lot of ages, like up through adulthood. Um, and so like one category we would think of is gross motor movement. So for an adult, that might be going for a walk, going skiing, going to the gym, and other times, um, like, you know, doing, doing whatever you do to kind of get your body moving. For kids, that might be, um, you know, we, we have some BOSU balls, or kids, you know, balancing on a BOSU ball. It could be going outside and playing on a playground, absolutely. It could be riding a bike. Um, it could be using a body sock, which is what this kid I found on Google Images is doing. Um, they're super fun. Um, if you were paying attention to Beyonce music videos about six years ago, she also had one of those in a music video. So they're very trendy. Um, but they're super fun and they're actually, kids can actually see through them. And so you can kind of like be stretching and it's like a different way to move your body. And you've got to be like really present, but it's really fun. Um, we also have like spinners we use with kids, crash pads, which are really just like they sound like, like an enormous pillow. Um, we're always thinking about sort of safe ways to manage our energy, indoor or outdoor. Um, I've got some families I work with who are really into trampolines also. Um, so it can be anything from just going outside and taking a walk on the street, going to a playground nearby, doing jumping jacks with your kid, um, to some of the stuff that has, you know, requires kind of more stuff. Um, but you definitely don't have to have those things to do gross motor movement. Um, we also think about sensory supports. Um, and again, some of the things I have listed are things I would typically use with a younger kid. Um, it can be easy as sand, water, slime, whatever that means to you. Like there's a bunch of different recipes on the internet and Pinterest to make some kind of slime. Um, shaving cream has been super fun for our kids. We sometimes put like food coloring in it. Dry rice or dry beans or dry whatever you have. Um, Play-Doh, again, something you can make. I mean, I have a picture of these two kids playing in a water table, but we have also set kids up with like literal buckets, like buckets with water um, or like a Rubbermaid container. Um, we do a lot more like individual water buckets now for the few kids we do see in person as opposed to sharing them. Um, but when we think about sensory supports, that can be really helpful for like teens or adults too. Um, you know, a lot, I know a lot of people who really like to have um, like a nice smelling candle around in their house. Um, a lot of people who are into like essential oils, like super helpful. Um, we might think about with some of the teens that I work with, it tends to be particularly the girls, 
Um, but it's like a lotion that smells really good or like, oh, you know, like I know that I like the scent of body wash and that having that in the shower is helpful, kind of like as an ongoing self-care thing. Um, so we think about sensory. Um, I have a whole category of taking space, a lot of ways to take space. Um, we can set up some kind of a cozy corner. Um, it's helpful if kids have some kind of space where they can get away to. For some people, that's a whole room. For some people, that's like a blanket on a chair in the corner of the living room. Um, so having some kind of space place. Um, a lot of classrooms have a cozy corner, kind of some place where you can go where there's lots of soft things. You can kind of sit and be calm. Um, taking space can also just be a change of environment. And again, that's everyone age two to 100. If I'm super frustrated, um, if I can feel that things are kind of getting out of control for me, just walking to another room can be helpful. Um, just taking a little bit of space in that way. Um, and then something else that we use a lot with kids that we work with, and it really depends on your kid's experience, um, but we often find ourselves countering negative relational expectations. And what that means is that a lot of the kids that we work with um, have some fear of adults and have had negative experiences with adults in the past. And that may or may not be true for your kids. Um, but I start a lot of my sentences with, you're not in trouble, I'm not mad. Um, sometimes I start it with, you know, that was really scary. And then we say whatever it was. Um, and sometimes that can be, you know, we've had to redirect a kid and any kind of direction feels really scary. Um, or I wasn't totally managing my facial expressions and my eyebrows went like this a little bit and my face looked really mad. Oh, my face looked really mad, but I wasn't mad, I was worried. Um, I'm kind of prefacing a lot of things with that um, to try to kind of put kids at ease so that then they can hear the words that I'm saying so they don't totally lose those language, that language capacity. Um, additional regulation activity ideas. I know we're coming up on 650 and I have just a, just a couple of lists left. Um, but regulation ideas, again, to go full therapist, always into deep breathing. And that can be um, something that you like have a prop to do with. Feathers are great, balloons, bubbles. I have kids do butterfly breaths a lot of the time, which is just like standing up straight. You don't need anything to do it. And we just like kind of move our arms up and down with our breath. And that when I'm doing it gives them sort of um, a visual because we're taking deep breaths that should also be slow because if they're not slow, we're hyperventilating and that's not really helpful. Um, but it also kind of makes it more fun for them. And I have kids make up all kinds of animal breaths that they do. Um, so deep breaths. Uh, building, I mentioned Legos earlier, but also kind of like blocks, magnet tiles. Um, this is a great way to help kids like practice maintaining regulation. You've got to be pretty calm. You've got to be pretty focused, especially with the magnet tiles. You might get really frustrated. They fall apart pretty easily. And so in kind of a fun way through play, you're managing that. I um, mean, I know lots of families that like to do Legos all together, you know, whether the kid's six or the parent, you know, the parents joining in Legos too. Um, more gross motor activities, you know, yoga, various, various balancing things, setting up an obstacle course. I think that's been a really popular one, especially these days, setting one up inside. Um, and then just going back again to like tactile or sensory things, remembering water, shaving cream, Play-Doh, um, scented lotion, scented candles, um, whatever is going to kind of feel good. Um, well, I also use a lot, I have a lot of like, at my office, I keep like a squishy ball um, on my desk. Like I said, I'm kind of a high energy person. So when I'm on, you know, my 17th Zoom call of the day off camera, I'm kind of just like squeezing, squeezing the life out of this poor little like strawberry, I think, um, to kind of help me stay focused. Um, so these are some other ideas that we can use. And again, we're kind of practicing them when we're calm so that then we have those skills when we're not calm. Um, and then here I have a suggested book list. This is for younger kids. Um, and if you want a copy of um, the PowerPoint so you have this list, um, you can always email our training coordinator, Rizelle Busby, and I'll put her email address in the chat. Um, but all of these books are, are really great at helping facilitate discussion about feelings, discussion about regulation and coping, different options we have in terms of that. It's definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, but they're the ones that I find myself using a lot. Um, and they're in no particular order on here. I think they're like alphabetical. Um, and yeah, like I said, um, they're just the ones that I often use that I found really helpful with kids. Um, and so with that, I think we're at, we're at the end. And so 
I'm curious if folks have questions or thoughts or anything that came to mind. <laughs>